Hello everyone, welcome back to the War Room. And in this Learn As We Play segment, we're going into scenario four of Guderian's Blitzkrieg, the first edition uh, and the first OCS game to be made. Um, but let's talk about the last scenario, scenario three, marks our halfway point in our learning series here. We learned about surprise rolls, we learned about overruns, okay? Just additional things for combat to add to our combat toolbox. Now, in overruns, we learned how we can drive units out of particular spaces during the movement phases, all right? And it can potentially open up a lot of opportunities for blitzkrieging and encircling enemies. Surprise rolls, we learned, helps to shift column shifts on the combat roll table, whether it be left or to the right, depending on whether you're the attacker or the defender. However, I do need to correct something. I was rolling twice, two dice twice, for the attacker and for the defender. I'm not supposed to do that. That was a mistake. So I apologize, guys. Uh, you're only supposed to roll once and add the DRMs from the action ratings of the chosen action rating units. When we come back for scenario four, we're going to learn about supply and how supply affects combat. We're also going to learn about barrages. Supply, to me, is what is probably the most important thing in an OCS game. It's what makes an operational series game the most important. You know, guys like Rommel and Patton, these boisterous souls that were, you know, you saw them standing at the front lines, gazing out with, with their binoculars into the desert. That's not where their wars were fought. It was in the back lines, in the HQ at tents, and they were trying to figure out where to push the beans and bullets. All right? And that's what... OCS represents to me that struggle of pushing beans and bullets to where they need to go onto the front lines. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is what this scenario is going to teach us. It's going to add in supply, specialized units, and barrage combat. And again, supply, this is the reason why I got into OCS, because of the supply rules. Um, they're very good, and from what I think, from what I believe, it's the most realistic thing you can find. The rules examined on uh, the 9s, the 9.5 and 6, that's more um, on supply and how it affects combat when you don't have enough of it. All right, 11, supply in general, okay? So overall supply. And then 12 is going to be your specialized units. Let's talk about the objective of the game. The objective of this particular game is for the Germans to capture Orel or Soviets to capture Konotop. Anything else would be a draw. All right, so we have a little bit to unpack here. These are some of the rules that we have to go over. First rule is supply effects on combat and supply expenditure. I'm going to go and do the Cliffs Notes, and as we go into the game, uh, as the situations come up, I'll explain them a little bit further. But basically, in that combat sequence, when I told you, hey, we're not worried about this, it's not in the, uh, in the scenario, now it is. Basically, what this is saying is that if your attacker, the attacker stack, doesn't have the amount of supply it needs to do its thing, combat or movement, it can't do it. Simple as that, okay? For the defenders, it's a little bit different. Defenders will always have the option to attack. All right, even if they don't have the supply. But it says here, for defenders, if there's more than one regimental equivalent involved, all right, and the required supply is not available, then the defenders' units are halved in combat strength, basically. Okay, so you, you get a penalty. And that's on top of any modifiers that you get as a defender. All right, um, if 
you have one RE or less of units to defend, they still must be able to trace supply, which could be expended or they are halved as well. So if you so if you have a bunch of half like you know little battalions or regiments, um, and it's under that one RE, then basically you have to trace supply from that unit back to a supply source. And as long as you can do that, then you're fighting at the full strength. Otherwise, it's halved as well. So defenders will always have the option of fighting, but they can be halved if they don't have the supply or trace supply necessary to do what they need to do. Five B up here and it says here all the units in an attack must be able to trace independently that's attack not to defend all right supply must be traced into the attacking units hex not into an adjacent hex all right so it has to be into the attack hex right so wherever your attack stack is you start there and then you trace back to a supply point 5c or 9.5c enemy units and the hexes surrounding them block the ability of units to trace combat supplies so basically you can cut off enemy supply um with your units or vice versa your enemy can do that to you um if they're adjacent to your supply line so be cognizant of that all right um it says here if combat supply for either side is available a player must use the supply point Now the next rule that's added in here is ground support, air power, and artillery. And all it's saying is that whenever you're using these units to conduct barrage and ground support attacks, you can only do them in the barrage segments and no more than one barrage attack may be made against a particular target in a given phase. So I only get one shot at it. Next rule that's being added is specialized combats. Now there's gonna come situations where you are going to have special types of units that are in those hexes and there's ways of dealing with them. Now, some of your units may have a zero combat value. Now, I just wanna make a side note that this is in a system. OCS is a system. Guderian's Blitzkrieg is one game within the system. Now, I've not noticed, at least not yet making this video, I've not noticed a unit that has zero combat and when i say unit i mean an attacking unit a combat unit we're not talking supply trucks or anything like that a ground unit or um, our air unit just but it's a unit i'm thinking of fighting force um but you may have an ocs game that does so when you see something like this it, it i'm assuming this is for all games that are under the ocs rules all right so any units with a zero combat value um you know they uh, they contribute zero to the defense and the attack, and they can be used to absorb step losses. All right, and if you do come across a unit or several units that are zero in a stack and they're by themselves, you would use the right furthest column on the combat table when you're rolling. So you don't even have to figure out the roll table. It's all the way to the right, which gives the attacker the advantage. Okay, now B in this segment is supply points and dumps. So let me just be clear. Anytime you have a supply point on your the board, and I'll show you that when we set up the board, that's considered a dump. Okay, that's what they mean by dump. Anywhere you see little barrels, it's a it's a it's a counter with a barrel on it. All right, um, if they're sitting there by themselves and the enemy rolls into them, okay, then what you're going to use is what's called the it's called the dump truck and wagon capture table. I'm just going to call it the capture table at this point. All right, um, it's only used during movement phases. All right, dumps are not attacked. Okay, but a player may attack a hex containing enemy units which are also in a dump site. All right, so if there's an enemy unit sitting on top of a dump, then that would be a normal combat phase. All right, but if the enemy rolls into a dump, you use the capture table. Trucks on the other hand, up here, excuse me, a little different. So you have supply trucks, all right? Um, same thing, they don't attack, you don't attack trucks unless they have, you have, you know, units inside of the trucks as well, defending them. Um, if they roll in, you use the same capture table, all right? They do not, you are, they're not used to absorb step losses. Supply trucks do not absorb step losses, all right? But otherwise, it's the same rules as your supply points. Wagons, same thing. Sorry, guys, it's, it's a little uneven, so it shakes. Wagons, same thing. It looks like they have their own special little rules, but it follows the 9.16C. All right, and then you have HQs. HQs are interesting. 
HQs, they defend with a strength of five, but they do not attack. They never add to an attack. If they're forced to retreat, they go from the combat mode to the move mode automatically. HQs add their defense value to that of other units, okay? And they have an action rating of zero. That's kind of interesting. I, th I thought maybe, you know, you'd think they'd have a little bit more of an action. Well, it's not a unit technically. It's, it's a logistical thing, right? So simple enough, all right? So HQs, simple enough. So they do have a defense value. And finally, I'm not going to move this all around. There's a more section on this page. But now you have your air bases and air units. Now, in this scenario, I don't believe there are any air units. If there are, I apologize in advance. But air bases and air units, um, they're not attacked. But if a unit enters the hex, inactive air units are automatically destroyed. They're gone. Active air units... May just and we didn't haven't talked about any of these rules yet, so I, I don't think it's in this scenario. But active units may be displaced to other friendly bases. They are subjected to interceptions. They or you may have the active air unit remain in the hex. And then finally, we're talking about mixed target hexes. All right, this is where you have units, supply, truck, all in one hex. The enemy player may use barrage points on the barrage table to attack units or use the same points on the ground support and barrage versus dump truck table to attack trucks and supplies. In any such mixed case, the attacking player must select the desired target. The attacking player must decide what part of the what what unit he's attacking. Like it's like an operation, right? You're deciding are you going after supply or are you going after units? Interesting rule. I like that. And that's for barrage points. You only make such selections when you're doing those barrage attacks. Regular ground combats using the ground using the combat table only affect the enemy ground units in the hex. So if you're going into a combat, you're only affecting ground units. Regular combat. Barrage, you get to select. Imagine it as you got units sitting from afar with their field glasses looking into the area of operations and they decide to attack a certain unit. That makes a lot of sense there. I like that. Let's talk about supply. Let's go ahead and go over the introduction of supply, and then um, I'm gonna give you the Cliff's Notes of everything. There's a lot here, because this is the engine of the game, all right? But I don't wanna bog it down to where you're like, I don't wanna listen to this guy talk anymore. So let's go over the general gist of what supply is in an OCS game, and then we'll move on from there. So in the introduction, uh, basically we use supply points to pay for things such as combat, barrage operations, to sustain our armies, okay, construction of things, very important. Now there's a way that you can draw them, the supply points, we're going to call them SPs from this point on, as you can see right here, it's an SP, all right. Um, you can draw SP directly, all right, is if the SPs are within five truck movement points from the units, then you can, you can draw them directly from like a dump or from an HQ. All right, uh, an HQ is awesome because they could take supply from five points away and then force it five points further away from them to a unit that may be in their supply range. So HQs are gonna be very important to um, throw that supply where it needs to go. It says right here, uh, it even says here, that HQs are acts as a hose that delivers the SPs to the units that need them. All right, so positioning them and where you put your HQs are gonna be very important. Up here, we're talking about the over phase, which we haven't gone over yet, but basically this is where you sustain all your units. All right, and there's several supply levels that you need to sustain them at. We'll talk about levels here in a second. All right, um, certain levels will give you the full operational advantage of each unit, while others will, will not even allow you to attack. Players also expend SPs in order to conduct combat, perform barrage artillery, attacks with artillery, and for a number of construction operations. So what is a supply point? It talks about an SP equals about 1,500 tons. That's just one point. So this particular example in the rule, that's, th that's 3,000 tons of supply, all right? Um, it says here the bulk of the tonnage is ammunition and fuel, and then everything else is the beans, right? The beans and bread, all right? 11.1a, mechanical handling of SPs. Players may break down and add together supply points freely, so that there's no restriction there. The conditions of them being loaded on a transportation unit, a truck, a wagon, has no effect of the use. 11.1b, 
supply tokens. All right, you can break down your supply tokens as desired. They're used to pay for a number of activities. We talked about that combat barrage and such. All right, now if you think of an SP, one SP as a dollar, inside that SP there are four tokens or four quarters, but they call them tokens. So you could break them down further. Then now they don't have markers for the tokens. It's just something you have to, um, you know, uh, mark and keep track of. But they could be used to supply certain units that are, you know, not at full supply level, or maybe they're a small battalion and they don't need as many supply points. 11.1c ownership of supply points. It is up to us, the players, to track who put down the ownership of supply and who and, and what. You know, if we move them around, we have to make sure we take care uh, not to lose track. Okay. And then um, you can never share amongst each other, obviously, that, that wouldn't make any sense. 11.2 divisional supply equivalence. So this is how we determine who gets what. Um, there are charts that determine how much supply goes to each unit, but this breaks it down for each unit itself. So the divisional supply equivalents, DSEs, all right, they determine supply usage in the over phase. One DSE is the equivalent to the normal supply usage of a non-mechanized division, or roughly 150 tons per day. All right, non-mechanized units count as one DSE. Armor, mech, fully motorized units are two DSEs. HQs add one DSE to its drawing group, those units getting supplied through that HQ, if the HQ is supplying units. So if you're picking a unit, a supply, an HQ, to supply other units, you have to add one DSE because that HQ has units within itself, logistical units, um, you know, forklift drivers, um, you know, laborers, moving that stuff around. Okay, it's abstract, but you, know, you, you have to pay for that as well. Okay. It's considered what is called a non-divisional unit, right? These, you know, the, the forklift driver is not going out to fight the fight. He's just there to move stuff around. HQs, which are not supplying units, count as non-divisional units in the group with which they draw supply, but they do not add one DSC themselves, okay? So if you're not using a particular HQ, all right, you don't add DSC to that, to that scenario, all right? When units draw directly from a supply source or dump, add one DSC to the total. So no matter when you draw any of your supply points you have to at least add one so the next thing we're going to talk about here is transportation of supply now the way this works is there are there are different capabilities and limitations that's going to be in the next segment we'll talk about that later okay so but just so you know there are limitations and capabilities leapfrogging so you cannot take your supply points and give it to another uh, tra you know, transport, to another transport, to another transport where it's limitless. They have limitations, okay? Uh, so that's illegal in this game. You can't do that. Levels of supply. Now, um, there are three types of levels, all right? And for the most part, we control it except for one. All right, and we'll go into that. But generally, you have control but there are going to be situations where you may have no choice but to either go into a different supply than you want to. Let's talk about that. There are three levels. You have full, low, and no supply. All right. Um, you can never voluntarily go into no supply. A unit can only go into one mode of supply ever or one level of supply. You can't, you can't switch in between during a phase. So supply requirements for each level, you have to calculate the supply points needed, all right? Obviously, we know what the DSC levels are for each unit, whether they're armor or not armor, but if, if, if you know what you need and you can supply that, you can give yourself full. Otherwise, half of this is needed for su low supply. So for example, if you've got an armor, one armor unit, and you know he's worth two DSC, all right, and you have to, you have to provide three, because you have your HQ and you want to put them at half, then you'd have to make change with the supply tokens. Okay. And you, you can select to put them at half. All right. If you cannot make the half, then you're at no supply. 
Now here's the restrictions of your level choice. If there's any SPs available, you can never place a unit into no supply. So if you can make a unit low supply, you have to. That's the lowest level that which you could put them at, as long as you have the supply points to do it. If you're using a single HQ for supply purposes, all the units using that one HQ must be at the same supply level. You can't have one guy going low, one guy going full. It doesn't work that way. You have to you have to figure out which supply level you want to be at for the HQ. Now, at a dump, it's different. You can select however you want to supply them. You have to keep track. So now we're going to go over unit supply. I'm going to use the books demonstration here to explain it. There's two ways you could receive supply, either from the HQ or from the dump directly. All right. Either way, you have to figure out your DSEs and you have to pay for them. All right. Um, so this is an infantry unit. That's one DSC. If it was an armor mechanized or mechanized infantry, it would be two DSCs. Plus, you'd have to add a DSC if you're using either the HQ or the dump. OK, so if this guy was being supplied from here, from the HQ, it would be two DSCs, one for the infantry, one for the HQ, and then you're good. The range at which you can collect either from the HQ or the dump is five truck movement points. OK, and I'll explain that in a, in a second because there's a little difference between the two. When you're taking supply from either one, you have to count through the hex, you have to count the, the, the movement points through the hex and the hex side that you're going through. So, for example, this is a river right here. I don't know if you can see that line. So, if I was going from this number two into this segment, it would be a clear plus one for the river because I'm going through that hex side. Whereas, if I'm going from two to here, I wouldn't be worried about the river. I'd be worried only about the wood that I'm entering. All right. So, that's what they mean by hex and hex side. You have to make sure that your movement points... Your truck movement points are calculated for the terrain. If we are getting supplied via the HQ, all right, remember to pay for your DSCs. We talked about that. Any units that are getting their supply from an HQ must enter the same supply level. Remember, we talked about three supply levels. No supply, which is you're not getting anything, to low supply, where you're getting some but not all, and then you're getting... Um, full supply, which is you're, you're going to be at your fullest supply that you could possibly be at for your units. When you're taking from an HQ, all those units in that HQ have to take the same amount of supply. Uh, think of it as a logistics officer, you know, today's supply. He's he's providing you a service. He's taking you uh, um, from the dump and he's throwing it to you directly. He's not going to sit there and say, oh, well, you only get a little bit, you get a little some. Okay, it doesn't work that way. So if you're going through the HQ, you have to decide what all your units in your stacks or all over coming from this HQ is going to get. It'll also make it easier in the game. Now, if you're taking from the dump, you don't have to worry about that. If you're taking from the dump, you can actually pick each individual unit what they are. It's like you're going personally to the bank and you're taking the money the way you want. Whereas at an ATM, you can only pick from $10, $20 increments, right? Now, the thing about HQ... If you're not in combat, so this unit is by himself, he's not in combat. If you have a unit that's not in combat, the HQ merely has to throw that supply adjacent. And then it's assuming that your guys are going to come and pick it up. All right, it's kind of a service that it provides. So technically, this unit is perfectly well um, supplied. You, you got the clear hex with a rail in it, another clear hex because we're not going through the, the river. I don't know if you can see that river. Okay. And then you're going into the wood, which is going to add a couple more points, which makes it five. But this unit is supplied because it's next to it and he's not in a combat. That's what HQs do, all right? It's like a supply drop. If you're taking from the dump, it has to be within five hexes. So obviously with all the wood here, there's no way that that would happen. Plus the river, there's no way he can get there. You have to be within the five range in order to get it. Same thing with HQ. The HQ has to reach within five hexes to the dump. Then he can throw it that extra space so there's kind of a benefit going to your um, through your HQ. That's a great way of throwing further down the road, especially for like battle fronts. You're keeping your dumps way well behind enemy lines, and then these guys are the ones that are going to throw it. So all you have to do is worry about the HQ and moving them around. Now, whenever there are SPs available, uh, supply points, 
you as a player have to supply your units. You can never select no supply. You cannot let your units go without. If you have the supply units, or the supply points, excuse me, you have to go at least low supply. That's a rule that has been brought up a couple of times. Now, if you don't have the points available, that's a different story. Now, there's a couple of restrictions here. You cannot leapfrog. We talked about leapfrogging. So it, it costs one DSC from this dump to supply this guy. So you're gonna go from five to three at this dump. All right, because you need one here and one for him. You cannot use another local HQ to supply him with that DSC. You can't leapfrog like that. So you, you know, so you're saving dumps, you know, you know, supply points. You can't do that. Keep that in mind, okay? Whenever we're dealing with supply points, it, it's it's individual for each person. There's no leapfrogging allowed in this game now. If there's later versions that allow it, I don't know about it. I haven't gotten there. This is the first. This is the first OSCS. So, according to this particular game, there's no leapfrog in these units. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about combat supply. I'm moving you. I apologize. Combat supply is real simple. Basically, there's a chart. Whenever you're in a fight. Um, that rule about having, you know, supply drop adjacent goes away. You're now like a dump. You have to be within the five ranges of the HQ as well as the dump in order to get supplied. Also, there's charts that tell you how much supply you need in order to stay in that fight. Now, I haven't showed any of those charts yet. I will at some point. But that's basically your supply, your unit supply and how you get them. So the couple of things we need to go over that we need to remember, just a, just a re quick recap. Don't forget your DSCs. Whether you're taking from the dump or the HQ, you're gonna add one, all right? You are able to be supplied from a dump within five hexes. You have to trace from the dump to the unit. If you're not in a fight, HQs can throw the extra, well, they, they go to five, and you can be supplied at the adjacent fifth, or adjacently from the fifth hex, all right? Um, if you have the supply available, you have to supply your units. You do. You never can go no supply voluntarily. All right. And then combat uh, changes that rule. You'll have to be indirect in order to be supplied. So, like, if there's a fight right now, this guy would be screwed. He would not have any supply. He'd be in no supply, and he wouldn't have a, a chance. He wouldn't have a, a say so about it. All right. All right, finally to end up, or to at least round up the uh, supply segment, we're gonna go into what's called dumps. Any stack of supply points on the map is a dump. All right, we, we, we kind of established that. Um, every SP stack on the map has a nominal garrison for the purposes of blowing it up, all right? This normal garrison never consumes supply and has no movement ability or combat strength. So in, there's an imaginary group of people protecting all the dumps just like hqs and dumps that's the non-divisional units that they talk about all right you you have you have to pay for supply to protect the dumps to store in the dumps to move the stuff around and so you have an option to blowing up a dump so if you know the enemy's coming you have a chance of getting rid of some of the supply so that the enemy doesn't collect it all right, now, before it goes into blowing dumps, it talks about an option of having an off-map pencil record of the dumps, and then you can take those dumps off the map. So, for example, you know, you write down the uh, hex number and then how many supply or, or how many SPs were in that dump. You can do that, but it also tells you there's a loss of playability. So, just an option um, for, you know, intelligence purposes. You don't want to give the guy too much information. You can play that way. Let's talk about blowing up the dumps. So, you may blow up a dump during your movement reaction exploitation phase. All right, you can try blowing it up more than once, but you may only make one attempt per phase. Simple enough. Um, you can select a portion of the SPs in the hex to blow it up, or if, if you don't want to, you don't have to destroy anything at all. There's a table that results in that. Again, more charts. We'll get into that. You'll roll one die on the dump blowing table to determine the number of SPs destroyed and remove these points from play. All right. Sorry, this is my, my stand's kind of in the way. All right. It says here, um, because of the dump's nominal garrison, no unit needs to be in the hex to attempt to blow up a, a dump. So that imaginary non-divisional group is there. It's always there and ready to go. 
capturing dumps. So if you're on the uh, receiving end of getting SPs, you, you can do this during your movement, combat, and reaction, or exploitation phases. So basically all your movement phases. You move into the hex and you're going to try and, and capture some of that supply. Um, whenever an enemy unit enters a hex containing a supply point, you roll on the appropriate column of the dump, truck, and wagon capture table to figure out what happens. Okay, if the enemy combat units occupy the dump hex, they must be evicted from the hex by combat for capture to occur. So if you're moving in and there's a guy there, you have to kill them first. You cannot just collect because you're in there. So that's how it works. They're, they're fighting for the supply. So simple enough. Our next phase, we're going to talk about our... The next segment, we're going to talk about specialized units. And that'll pretty much sum up most of our rules. And then we'll go into the practical on the war table and try to play this game. So now finally, we're going to add specialized units. This is the last uh, rule that we're adding into this segment. I know it's been taking a long time. This is maybe one of the longer videos, but it had to be done because this is probably the most important stuff is anything with uh, supply. Um, so let's start. So HQ and modes. It says that HQs have the same modes as other units, and these modes have the same effect on HQ units as any other. The only difference is um, whether the, you know, the HQ is in combat or... Um, uh, move, it doesn't matter. The one thing it cannot go into is DG by itself. It can't go into disorganized mode by itself. In the stack, yes, but not by itself. All right. And the designer made a couple of uh, notes about this, saying that um, the, the idea behind the HQ not going into DG is so that you're not headhunting HQs all the time. Uh, obviously, some people will know that you have HQs out there, and then you're not just hunting for that particular unit and then screwing over all your your uh, other units. So it just keeps the game flow, I think, a little bit more fair. Supply function of HQs, it's just kind of you know going over um, all of its functions, like as far as, you know, its uh, move points. Supply level of the HQ has no effect on the issue range available. I know I'm just kind of flying through these, but these are just like reiterations of what we already learned. Uh, HQs in combat, they do not attack, but they can defend with a strength of five. Okay, they do not attack. Um, if the HQ is forced to retreat, any HQ in combat mode must be flipped to the move mode side. All right, no exceptions. All right, it says here that HQs are immune to attack and destruction via the barge, barrage table. And again, he, re, he reiterates... He doesn't want HQ hunting. And finally here, um, <clears throat> well not finally, we've got quite a few things to talk about. Supply effects on HQ are the same supplies levels drawing from it. Unit assignment. So basically what it's saying here is you, you count up all the DSCs you need in your uh, units and then keep track of it. So you keep the game going. Keep, so there should be a lot of um, counting of DSCs for supply count them and try to keep a record of them it even says to try to keep units together so that and organized so that they keep getting the same dscs it'll help with the game flow and also um for you too so you're not pulling out pads of paper although it does mention you may end up using pads of paper uh but the less the better obviously there are different there are higher levels of hq uh it says at the core level and stuff um just treat them as the same as anybody else so now we're dealing with truck and wagon units, and basically these are the way that we move supply from point to point. Printed on each counter, it is the point value and movement allowance. Supply effect on trucks. Trucks never expend supply. Easy enough. Truck transport capacity. Truck transports up to their point value in SPs and assist in the movement of units according to the motorization and unit transport rules. So there's more rules coming up. Trucks may freely divide and combine using the sizes available. Such splitting and combining does not cost MPs. May be done only in the friendly movement phase. All right. And it requires all units, all involved units in one hex. Okay. So you can split and combine as long as they're all friendly units in one hex. Um, wagons and trucks may never combine into a single counter. Wagons may never split up into trucks. All right. Restrictions on trucks. Trucks have no mode, thus may never take advantage of strategic move mode or reserve mode. Trucks may only move in the owning player's movement phase, never in the reaction and exploitation phases. <clears throat> trucks may be transported by ship or train. They may never be transport loaded. 
All right. So you can't you shipment points onto a port. That truck moves from port to port. Doesn't happen. <clears throat> Trucks may never transport units. Trucks may affect unit movement only by increasing the motorization level of the units. I'm not sure what motorization level of the unit means, so we're going to have to figure that out. Trucks load and unload SPs at a cost of five movement points. Wagon load and unload SPs at a cost of two. You place the SP um, marker underneath the trucks. It shows its uh, um, the condition of it loading stuff. Under here, you got truck stationing. This is optional. We're going to leave that out for now, only because um, it hasn't been really like emphasized, so I'm just going to leave any optional rules alone. All right, so we're getting into the rail transport. I'm going to try and fly through this, and as things come up, we'll go over in the uh, on the war table. All right, but basically, I'm going to speed through this. So there is a capacity which you, represents the total number of SPs your rail resources can transport. All right, the RE size of your units will transfer over to how many SPs you need. And when you calculate the SPs, you're, remember, you're, you got times by two because each game turn, you each player will play twice. If you remember in the game sequence, you play twice in a turn. All right, so don't forget that. So basically, you're going to multiply whatever it is your RE size is times two in order to know what your, your rail um, SPs are required to move those units. In this next rule, basically, you're allowed to transport anywhere where your railheads are uh, as long as it's within your railhead markers. There are markers that denote your railways versus your opponent's railways. Okay, you can use any part of the rail's capacity to use that rail network. All right, you, the railroad trace may not include any hexes containing or adjacent to enemy ground combat units, which makes sense. And friendly units do not negate this restriction. Basically, this is uh, talking about the differences between German rail and Russian rail. If a load moves for its entire rail movement along multi-track rail hexes, that load costs half its normal cost in rail capacity. If a load moves for any of its rail movement along low capacity rail hexes, the load costs double its, its normal cost and capacity. And again, we'll, if it happens, I'll, I'll get into it more. Players may use his rail capacity only in friendly movement phases, never in reaction or ex exploitation mode. Simple. All rail movement requires that you load to entrain, move, and detrain in a single movement phase. So you're going to load, move, and then disembark all in one shot. You don't you don't just leave them in one section and then come back later. Units and SPs may entrain or detrain in any village or city railroad hex, which is not adjacent to an enemy unit. To entrain, a unit may have expended no more than half of its movement allowance in the current move phase. So you can't go over half your movement allowance to get onto the train. When detrain, units may not move further in the given phase. So once you detrain, you're done. You're, you're over with. And training and detraining have no MP cost of their own. Units must be in mo move mode or strategic move mode to use rail move railheads. The game may limit one or both player railheads due to gauge problems or destruction. Mark these limits hexes with rail markers, railhead markers. Also, mark the edges of destroyed portions of railroads with railhead markers. Railhead markers cannot move of their own accord, only upon the destruction of railroads by enemy units or by extension work of rail repair units. All rail hexes up to and including the railhead markers are functional. So basically this marks an end of the rail. Okay, they don't move. You have to they can only be moved by construction battalions, basically. But once they're there, that's that's the end of the rail for you. Okay, the destruction of railroads. If you choose to, you can if you're in combat or move mode, you may destroy railroad hexes by expending a fourth of your movement allowance in a hex. So, um, if you have eight movement points, you can get rid of two of them to destroy a railroad hex. Okay, very simple. A single unit may destroy as many railroad hexes in a given player turn as its MA allows. Mark destroyed hexes by placing railhead markers on either side of the destroyed hex. Players may destroy their own railroads, which is probably smart for strategic purposes. Railroad repair. A railroad repair unit can repair three destroyed rail hexes each movement phase. Note, RR units have only a repair mode. They may repair only in the friendly movement phase 
RR units that are in no supply cannot repair railroads. Simple. Um, railroad units have one RE and may move by rail. RR units may not use rail movement and do repairs in the same movement phase. So you can move, wait, and then do it again. You can't do them both. It says here, and they do some bullet points. Railroads may not be repaired in hexes adjacent to enemy units, obviously, for uh, safety reasons. Friendly units do not negate this rule. Each hex of railroad repair costs one token. Remember what tokens are. That's uh, one quarter of a supply point. To repair a hex of railroad, the RR unit must move into the hex using its movement points. Simple enough. Artillery units. Artillery units may participate in barrage attacks against units they are not adjacent to. Artillery units have their range in hexes printed on their counter. Defending artillery adds to a defense by conducting barrage attacks in the reaction phase. Our artillery units may move and fire in the same turn. Artillery units may not barrage if the reserve, if in reserve or strategic Remember what reserve is. You're waiting. You're not moving. You're standing by. Strategic move mode. You're you're most likely you've broken down this artillery unit. You're not move. You're not in a fight mode at all. So they're not in any position to attack. When an artillery unit defends a hex against enemy ground attack, each artillery unit has a combat strength of one, regardless of the printed barrage strength. Add this defensive strength to that of any others in the hex. Okay, that would make sense. So the, remember, artillery is a long-range unit. So if you've got enemies attacking your 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 hex, they're not going to have that ability to get a, a, a stronger a stronger uh, attack. Barrage attacks. A barrage attack is the only way artillery units may attack. Resolve barrage attacks on the barrage table. Remember, there's charts for that. The appropriate players and units may conduct barrage attacks in the reaction, combat, and exploitation phases. Any number of artillery and aircraft may participate in a single barrage attack. No more than one barrage attack per hex per phase is allowed. To conduct a barrage attack, expend combat supply for the attack using the amounts listed on the com combat and barrage supply tables. I'm going to leave it there. Again, as we get into it, we'll go into more detail. Division markers. You may see me use these. Um, these help with uh, providing a little order. Um, it reduces the counter density and relieves map congestion. So you may see me uh, use some of these in the game. I will use this. It's a bigger optional um, listed uh, thing, so I may use this. Um, I think it would be a smart idea. Finally, engineer functions. I'm just reading the top part. If each game lists those units which have engineer capabilities. Such units may apply any part of rule 12.8. Uh, HQ units always have engineer abilities, capabilities. Each listed unit has a minimum of engineer assets which can be used for assorted engineer functions, except to do rail repair. Only rail repair units may do this so. So engineer functions do not allow for rail repair. Okay, they can do bridging which we'll get into, um, and I think, oh, and construction. Up here, there's, there's construction. So they do bridging and construction, and as we need to, we will discuss it as we, uh, as we go. So that's all the rules for the next segment. I want to get this on the table as much as possible. If you have questions about engineering or specialized units, we can go over it specifically. Just put some comments in the, um, in the comment section below. All right, but we're going to leave it at this and get this game onto the board and then get into the more better details of what this game's about because these are more of the finer details and I don't want to get bogged down.